enormous freight train is out of control, tearing through the Canadian Rockies. The crew does nothing to slow the train's terrifying speed. Jack, are you there? Charging the other way, a passenger train with more than a hundred people on board. Front end, Jack, come in. It's one of the most spectacular train rides in the world. Every year, thousands of people take the slow and easy way through Canada's Rocky Mountains. Avoiding traffic, they take the train and leave the driving to somebody else. In late winter, 1986, a gentle trip through the Rockies will end tragically. It was like a mini atom bomb. And all of a sudden, it ignited. Woof. I'm going to help you. I can hear the women screaming, you know, um, to save her baby. An investigation makes shocking discoveries about the Canadian railroad industry. At that time, I didn't think that anything was wrong. February the 8th, 1986. Spectacular northern lights dance across the sky over Edson, Alberta in Western Canada. Driving freight trains has been a lifelong dream for 48-year-old Canadian National Railways engineer, Jack Hudson. But after 16 years on the job, he knows all too well that it can be a grueling career. Because Canadian freight trains travel such vast distances, up to 12 local crews may be used in the course of one cross-country journey. Hudson works a mountainous stretch of track through Alberta running between his hometown of Jasper and Edson to the east. Like many trainmen, Hudson works a regular beat, driving over the same stretch of track, then turning around again with another train, day after day. At around 11 p.m. last night, Hudson got off the freight train from Jasper and spent the night here in the company bunkhouse at Edson. Now he's up again after just three and a half hours of sleep, ready to return to Jasper. At this station, he's joined by his brakeman, like Hudson, 25-year-old Mark Edwards lives in Jasper. And like Hudson, he hasn't slept very much. Did you get some rest? Not much. Got a touch of the flu. Could use a full night's sleep. <laughs> Hudson and Edwards will ride up front in the first engine. Hudson drives the train while Edwards keeps an eye on the brakes and pitches in if Hudson needs any help. Known to his fellow railmen as Smitty, 33-year-old Wayne Smith is Hudson's conductor. He's the last of the three-man crew in charge of the freight train this morning. Smitty? Smith rides in the caboose, the last car in the train. He acts as an extra set of eyes, making sure the men in the front end know what's going on behind them. The three men are longtime employees of Canadian National, or CN, rail. And all of them have been up and down this length of track countless times before. The train they're riding today is enormous, 
CN train 413 is just under two kilometers long. The cars are filled with a collection of grain, metal pipes, and chemicals. It tips the scales at more than 11 million kilos. As the freighter rolls into Edson, it slows to a crawl, but doesn't stop. Getting it started again would take time, and the crew wants their trip to begin as soon as possible. Hudson and Edwards take the train on the fly, boarding it as it rolls slowly along. According to CN Rail's code of conduct, this is illegal, but it's something crews do routinely. With the caboose still nearly two kilometers away, Smith stands by the track to inspect the cargo as it crawls by. He makes sure there's nothing obviously wrong with the freight or the cars carrying it. All set, Jack. Clear signal leaving Edson. Clear signal leaving Edson. Another part of Smith's job is to stay in touch with the front end of the train. He's supposed to make sure they're alert throughout the journey. Now, with the caboose pulling alongside the platform, Smith climbs aboard. Okay, he's got the brakes off. You're good to go. See you later. At 6.40 a.m., Hudson pushes the throttle. The freight train picks up speed as its 8,000 horsepower diesel engines open up. The CN freight train begins the long haul west to Jasper. The men are going home. Dispatcher to 413. Good morning, dispatcher. Good morning, Jack. But Hudson isn't sure exactly how long his train is, or precisely what he's carrying. Dispatcher at Medicine Lodge here. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, that's, uh, you got pretty well all grain cars, eh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it should be the right lane then. OK, OK, thanks. As 413 roars west, a Via passenger train speeds east on the same track. Via Rail's supercontinental passenger train number four is cruising toward Edmonton, Alberta. More than 100 passengers are enjoying the spectacular scenery as it cruises through the rugged Canadian Rockies. 36-year-old Jamie Haight is a car assembly operator. He's headed home to Ontario after a two-week visit to his family in Vancouver. It's a very, very small community that you're, you're in close proximity with a lot of people very, very suddenly. And, and so there's a, a lot of people we got to meet and got to, got to interact with. I remember there was a couple of ladies that we, that we met over dinner. One was, was, was very, very pregnant. While some passengers are still sleeping, Haight goes into the day coach to do some reading before breakfast. It's the fourth car in the train. I remember this, uh, this lady, and she had a, a little boy with her, about three years old or whatever. He was quite in awe. The little child was quite in awe of the scenery. So I sat down on it, and I lifted the shade a little bit so I could get some of the daylight coming in, and I started to read a pocket novel. Several cars behind Haight is 61-year-old assistant conductor Herbert Timpey. An old hand on the Canadian passenger line, he's been riding this piece of track for seven years. I had to be the assistant conductor and look after the passengers on that train. Next stop, Hinton. The passenger train is pulling into Hinton. The freight train is just about to reach Hargwin Station, 20 kilometers east. Here, the rail line briefly splits into two, so trains can pass each other. 413 will take the upper track, while the passenger train passes below it. As Hudson approaches the split in the tracks, traffic signal lights tell him to slow down. Smitty, we've got an approach limited signal at Hardwick. Next station, Dalehurst, over. 
Head into 413, approach limited at Hargwin. Next station, Dalehurst, out. These are the last words these men will ever exchange. The dispatcher in Edmonton sets a switch and 413 is forced onto the upper track. The Via passenger train arrives at Hinton Station at 8.20 a.m. On board, 64-year-old Martin Pedersen settles down to breakfast in the downstairs lounge of the dome car. He's feeling rested after a good night's sleep. A former World War II fighter pilot, Pedersen has a lot of experience with locomotives. Over the course of the war, he blew up 36 enemy trains in France. The night before, Pedersen swapped war stories with another veteran he met on board. 61-year-old Kenneth Cuttle is a former Royal Marine. It was February. I was going to Edmonton to look for another job. Like Pedersen, Cuttle also fought behind enemy lines in World War II. Cuttle and Pedersen are survivors. Uh, let's go upstairs to the dome car, have a look around, see what's happening. The train was pretty comfortable, you know, not many people on board. I said, let's go up to the dome car because it was just coming light and we see lots of things which you might not get another chance to see. We were in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. There are now 115 people on board. But the train will never make it to Edmonton and the passengers and crew enjoying the early morning trip will soon be fighting for their lives. It's a clear, sunny morning on board a passenger train in Western Canada. Breakfast is being served as the train rolls east through the Canadian Rockies. Just 15 kilometers away, an 11 million kilo freight train, CN413, rumbles down the track towards it. With diesel engines still pounding at full throttle, it's pulling 113 rail cars of grain and hazardous material. From the outside, everything looks normal. But what's going on inside the lead engine of 413 is about to become one of the greatest mysteries in Canadian railroad history. Freight trains and passenger trains often travel on the same track. For short sections, the track splits, so trains heading in opposite directions can pass safely. Today, 413 is on the upper branch. Signals tell the freight train to slow, then stop completely. The signals will only turn green again once the passenger train has passed safely by below. Then the freight train can rejoin the main line. But 413 isn't slowing down. It's now heading downhill and it charges through the warning lights. If it doesn't stop soon, it will return to the main line at full speed, straight into the path of the passenger train. Unaware of the bizarre behavior of 413, the passenger train continues east. Martin Pedersen gets his breakfast. Hi. the freighter thunders through the last set of light signals, ignoring three red lights that command it to stop. It slams back onto the main line. It's traveling 95 kilometers an hour and weighs more than 11 million kilos. And still, it doesn't slow down. Herbert Timpey sits to relax. Ken Cuttle has a clear view of the railway ahead. I got in uh, conversation with an English guy, and he had his back to the front, and I was looking over his shoulder, forward, the way the train was going. There was a flickering light in the distance. And not knowing the track layout, I thought, oh, there must be another line, and if it's another train, it's going to go past us, you know?
after surgery in the parking lot, one of the girls from the party or group happened to just walk past me. Trains collide like two charging rams at a combined speed of nearly 200 kilometers per hour. Passengers are rocked by one collision after another as 70 freight cars pile into the wreckage. Like an incoming wave, grain cars, long pipes, three foot in diameter, 30 feet in length, you name it. And these were flying through the air like toys. Thrown from the tracks by the force of the collision, one freight car flies through the air, smashing to a stop on the Via train. The whole world seemed to explode. It was like a mini atom bomb. It was a big mushroom of black smoke. Then, everything was dark. They could no longer breathe because everything was filled with smoke. Oh, I'm gonna die. And the third thing that happened was I just resigned myself to that. I've been working about 37 years and uh, on the railroad and I never, never seen anything so bad. The wave of metal, the grain cars, stopped just where the dome car was. If it had gone another 30 feet, it would have covered us as well. In the same car, one deck below, Martin Pedersen struggles to escape. But he can barely see what's happening in front of him. The window beside him shattered during impact, filling his eyes with broken glass. Almost two kilometers behind the engine, the caboose of train 413 finally lurches to a stop. Conductor Wayne Smith sees a ball of fire glowing in the distance, but he has no idea how bad the situation is. Front end 413. I think we're in the bush or we're derailed. There is a big explosion up here and we have chemicals on the train, so stay away from it. Stay away from the dangerous goods. But all Smith gets in reply is an ominous silence. Passengers continue to struggle to escape the mangled wreck of their train as the smoke thickens. I was trained well in the Royal Marines to survive and to act spontaneously. There was a window at the back of the dome car and it was all cracked and I just jumped up on the seat, smashed my head through the glass roof and shouted, come on, let's get out. Cuttle and others jump from the car. And I looked back, and all of a sudden, it ignited. Woof. Down below in the lounge car, Martin Pedersen also manages to escape. But others aren't so lucky. Many are still trapped in the burning cars, including passenger Jamie Haight. The roof of the coach had been crunched down. I mean, I'd lost my glasses. I couldn't see, I couldn't breathe. And here it was the porter that had been behind the snack bar, had opened up this, this exit way, and he had vamoosed out through it and I took off out behind it, too. Snap out of it. He was in shock. Hey, snap out of it. 
hey, buddy, you pull it together here. You know, there's people in here, and we got to do something about it. But half blind without his glasses, Haid goes back inside, trying to help others out of the wreck. Four one three here, dispatcher. Back in the caboose, Smith is talking to the freight train's dispatcher, some 285 kilometers away in Edmonton. everything in the air. We're going to get a doctor out here and some ambulance. Herb Timpey, the assistant conductor on the passenger train, can hear the conversation on his radio and breaks in. Passenger coaches all over the ditch. And get an ambulance. And there's a whole bunch of cars on fire. You get that, dispatcher? We need the fire department here very badly. Some coaches are trapped with passengers inside. They're burning. I don't think the engineers lived through this one. It's a real mess. OK, that's right on the switch at Dalehurst, eh? Yes, I'm going to walk up there and see if I can be of any assistance. What was the signal at Dalehurst when your head in called it? Uh, pardon me? What was that signal on that signal at Dalehurst? Well. Well, I was calling him for the signal at Dalehurst quite a few times, but uh, I, I kept calling him and there was no answer. Well, it should have been read on the panel. Well, he must have ran it then, dispatcher, because I could not get a hold of him. I tried and I tried. Okay, all, all right. Back at the head of the passenger train, Jamie Haight tries to save who he can. Are you okay? I'm gonna help you. Hate can hear the screams of men and women trapped in the flames. And I can hear the women that I had dinner with the night before screaming, you know, um, to save her baby. <laughs> Hate was not able to save the mother and her child. They're out of reach under debris. That was, uh, that was difficult. People who were trapped and couldn't get out, screaming, screaming like you've never heard. One guy knew that his wife was trapped and he went back in and died with her. Another woman in the carriage under where we were had most of a leg cut off. James Haight courageously decides to go back inside. <laughs> the fire is a scorching 660 degrees, but Haight tries to save one more life. But there, was a, there was a chap right in front of me there, and it was the chap I'd had dinner with the night before. And all of a sudden, the flames came and consumed him. He just, just sat up and rubbed his head and... Because there's nothing more we could do it for him. Anybody in front of me in that coach was dead. For whatever the reasons, it wasn't my time to go then, for whatever the reasons. Wayne Smith is devastated. He can't reach his two friends at the front of the freight train, and he can't understand what happened to cause such an enormous disaster. In Western Canada, a freight train has smashed head-on into a passenger train carrying more than 100 people. In the minutes after the collision, survivors are dragging themselves from the burning wreckage, while others are still trapped inside. One of the girls that had been in the, in the car in the morning, and I looked at her and I said, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, you're... He had no choice but to tell her what happened to her friend in the train. Your, uh, uh, your friend was in the car here. She died trapped in the burning debris. I felt like the worst person in the world, because I had to tell her. If I could have taken back that one second in time to not tell her, you know.
Royal Canadian Mounted Police Constable Mark Linnell is one of the first to arrive on the scene. I was told there was a train derailment, not a train crash. I mean, there's a double whammy. The RCMP officer came. He could hardly speak. His mouth dropped open, and he said, I can't believe what I'm witnessing. It's a horrifying scene. Pictures taken shortly after the crash show utter devastation. I mean, I was, I was just flabbergasted. I just couldn't believe it. And I, instant. That's quite the thing to see. The collision is 18 kilometers from the town of Hinton. It takes emergency crews some 45 minutes to get there. I was in the Marines in England for 14 years, and I'd seen a lot, a lot of disasters, man-made disasters, terrorist bombs. And I thought I'd seen it all. There was a lot of blunt force trauma, of course, flying glass, burns. And then I saw what appeared to be two bodies in the restaurant car hugging each other. So we found out later that was a man and wife. And this was one heck of a shock. As Linnell is escorting survivors away from the site, he sees a lone man with a radio coming down the track. How's the, uh, how's the front end doing? Uh, what's your name? It's Smith is about to learn that his colleagues aboard his train are dead. Like what happened? Like, did they make contact with the... We're still under investigation, and there's not a lot I can tell you right now. OK, so they still might be... I mean, I'm really sorry. They'd be distraught and shaken, and his yes, train is wrecked, and all these people dead. The Hinton train disaster is the worst railway accident to strike Canada in 35 years. More than $30 million in property are destroyed. 23 people are dead, and 71 others are severely injured. Wayne Smith is the only surviving crew member of the CN train, the only man who may be able to explain how an 11 million kilo freighter plowed headfirst into an oncoming passenger train. What he knows could be critical to unraveling the cause of the disaster. Two days after the collision, the Alberta government establishes an official commission of inquiry, and the Honorable Mr. Justice René P. Foisy leads the investigation. Judge Foisy is a justice of the Alberta Court of Appeal. It was uh, reasonably simple. I mean, what caused the accident? Uh, but it turned out to be a lot more complicated than that because uh, the, there were no easy answers as to what caused the accident. Freight and passenger trains routinely use the same tracks without incident. What was different this time? Over the next 11 months, Foisy calls on 150 witnesses and specialists to help him find out. I think what has most surprised me is the, the complex procedures, the equipment, um, the overall complexity that, uh, that we have to look at in running a railroad and what goes on in running a railroad. While Conductor Smith recovers from the accident, Foisy gets to work. He begins by studying the signals that should have told the freight train to stop. If they weren't working, the crew on 413 may not have thought they needed to slow down. GN did a, uh, a very in-depth test on the signal system, and it was determined that uh, it was performing uh, properly. We went further. We uh, hired our own independent experts to test the system. The switches which operate the signal lights were frozen in position after the accident. Electrical engineer Eugene Couch was hired to read them. Perhaps a mechanical fault in the system had turned them green, 
telling the freight train to speed through. A fault does not give a positive green light to any, any situation. So if, if there was a fault in any controls part of the system, it would have forced everything to go to red, which meant the passenger train would have stopped and would have forced the freight train to stop. If a mechanical problem wasn't the cause, there was a more chilling possibility. Perhaps someone set the freight train lights to green on purpose, causing the two trains to collide. Couch dismissed that idea too. To do that would mean that somebody would have to actually go there and really maliciously you know, change things. And there was no sign of any tampering on, on any mechanisms. Basically, our conclusion, we felt that the system was sound and was safe. Foisey believes the lights were red, but the freight train ignored them. Perhaps another mechanical fault was behind the crash. Well, well I was calling him for the signal at Dalehurst Court. In his statement after the crash, conductor Wayne Smith told Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers that something was wrong with his radio that morning. Because I could not get a hold of him. I tried and I tried. Maybe the front of the train was having mechanical problems, but they weren't able to get in contact with Smith. Joseph Hebert examines the portable radios the crew used. The first test was with the radio that was on the train that uh, was in the accident at Hinton. The radio performed to specification. But even if the radios themselves were working, there could be another problem. Many CN employees claim there are places along the tracks where radio communication is impossible, so-called dead spots. And it's not a dead spot that's there 365 days out of the year. The possibility Sometimes was also examined and dismissed. Sometimes you can't. Some radios are stronger, some are weaker. The second test done as far as communication between the locomotive and the caboose was done with the same type of radio as was used at the time the accident took place. The field test with that type of radio had satisfactory performance. The evidence was uh, pretty clear, and we concluded that, that there were no dead spots. One other possible explanation is examined. Natural phenomena, like the northern lights, can also affect radio performance. Um, we've got to measure a medicine light. Northern lights can build up very high currents and communications lines. Anything even hooked up to a radio could pick it up. My determination of it was that uh, they were not a factor. If the signals were red and the radios were working, why had the train crashed? Foisey examines an ingenious piece of technology, the hotbox detector. Sitting beside the track, hotboxes monitor the temperature of a train's wheels and axles. They also record the speed of trains as they roar by. When Foisey and his advisors examine the hotbox data, they make a telling discovery. When the front of the freight train passed the hotbox detector just after Hargwin, it was traveling a little over 60 kilometers an hour. But by the time the caboose passed it, the train was going more than 74 kilometers an hour. Despite the signals telling it to slow down, the train was speeding up. For the last five miles, we were able to determine that the uh, freight train was going uh, at least uh, 59 miles an hour, perhaps as high as 60 or 61. There were no brake applications before the crash as well. The crew let the train travel too fast. They did not heed signals to stop, and they never applied the brakes. It all points to a train that was out of control. Why there were no brake applications is difficult to understand. Oh my God! With mechanical problems ruled out, Foisey begins to examine the crew of the freight train. Perhaps there's something about engineer Jack Hudson, who was in charge of the train, that could explain what happened that day. As Foisey begins sifting through Hudson's medical records and interviewing his family, he makes a disturbing discovery. A train collision in Western Canada has killed 23 people. Another 71 are injured. The man leading the inquiry into the disaster has ruled out mechanical problems. Judge René Foisey now takes a closer look at Jack Hudson, the 16-year veteran who was driving the freight train. 
When Foisy and the Commission review Hudson's medical files, they're shocked by what they discover. Mr. Hudson was a, was a man who, who was sick. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He had um, high blood pressure, which was uh, problematic. He had diabetes. He had a, a pancreatic attack uh, the summer before this accident. He had to wear a colostomy for a number of months. Foisy wonders if this long list of illnesses could somehow have led to the train crash. The engineer, Jack Hudson, uh, had been killed outright in the crash and had severe injuries. So we couldn't determine whether there'd been a catastrophic medical event, whether he'd had a heart attack, for example, or a stroke, which had incapacitated him. But we were able to do toxicology, and there was no alcohol or drugs present. He did have a lot of health problems, and he had some problems at home. Uh, that uh, these problems at home appeared to be on the mend, and uh, that he was not the kind of man who, if he was going to commit suicide, would take uh, 23 people with him and injure another 70, uh, some of them very, very seriously. So we discounted that possibility of a suicide. If it wasn't suicide, if Hudson did have a stroke or heart attack at the controls, why didn't his brake man, Mark Edwards, take any action? Investigators come up with one plausible answer. Did you get some rest? Not much. Got a touch of the flu. Could use a full night's sleep. Perhaps Edwards had been asleep on the job. Dr. Allison Smiley is an expert on sleep and fatigue. Jack Hudson, he had had at the very most before he went on duty that day, three and a half hours of sleep. And that is if he slept from the last moment somebody saw him till the moment somebody next saw him again, three and a half hours. Brakeman said he had a touch of the flu and he'd had five hours sleep the night before. Wayne Smith uh, similarly had had uh, insufficient sleep about five hours before they collision. As the freight train passed the signals telling it to stop, the entire crew may have been fast asleep. You could work at any time of the day. So one day you might start at four o'clock in the morning, uh, the next day you start uh, at two in the afternoon. Their hours were so erratic, they were continually in a jet lag state because their physiology was never sort of fully adjusted to uh, any particular working hours. When it comes to staying alert, train engineers face many challenges, including long rides up and down the same stretch of track. The tracks going by one after the other, it's a very soporific situation to work in and easy to see how somebody, no matter how motivated, could fall asleep. At the time, trains were equipped with safety devices that would automatically stop a train if the engine man died or fell asleep, the so-called dead man's pedal. Basically, the engineer is supposed to keep his foot on the pedal. And while he's, his foot is on the pedal, the train won't stop. If that pedal isn't depressed, uh, then uh, it will, after a number of seconds, give a warning, which is uh, quite audible. And if nothing happens, then it will stop the train. But Foisy discovers that for many trainmen, disabling the dead man's pedal is standard practice. One of the excuses that was given by the, uh, the, the engineers is that uh, to go long distances, having to keep your foot on that pedal was very uncomfortable. And uh, so that they would sometimes uh, put something on the pedal, a lunchbox or something heavy enough to keep it depressed so that they could stretch their legs. Unfortunately, uh, what was happening, this pedal was being depressed for long, long periods of time. But even if Edwards and Hudson had fallen asleep at the front of the train and the dead man's pedal was rigged, conductor Wayne Smith at the back could still have prevented the disaster. Almost two months into the Foisy inquiry, Smith takes the stand. Doctors had kept him from testifying earlier, saying he was too traumatized by the accident. Now, for the first time, investigators will hear Smith reconstruct events on board his train in the moments leading up to the disaster. I was sitting looking out the back of the train from my desk when we uh, passed mile board 169. 
That's the, uh, that's the landmark that I used to initiate a call to the engineer to ask for the display at the Dalehurst approach signal. At end of 413, what indication do you have at the Dalehurst approach signal 1703 over? The front end of the train is supposed to respond, letting Smith know that they've seen the signal lights telling them to slow down. Head of 413, can you hear me? Over. I, I probably called them three or four times. I, uh, I didn't get a response on my gray radio. There was, uh, there was something wrong with it. What's the indication at signal 1703? Over. It's a surprising piece of testimony. Foisy already knows the radios were working fine. When Smith is asked how fast he thought the train was going before the collision, Foisy gets another surprise. <clears throat> I felt the front end give a light brake application on the caboose. Uh, coming around the curve, I felt we were doing a track speed of about 50 miles an hour or less. But according to the hot box detectors, the train was traveling almost 16 kilometers an hour over track speed and there was never any application of the brakes. I went to my red radio and I tried to get a hold of them on it. Jack, how's the Dalehurst approach signal 1703? I was calling them on channel one three or four times and there was no answer, so I tried to get a hold of them on different channels. But once again, Smith's testimony doesn't add up. Foisy has heard from other trainmen who were monitoring their radios in the area that day. No one heard Smith call. Smith says he was still Jack, trying to contact there? Hudson when the end of the train raced past signals telling it to slow down. Jack! As an experienced trainman, Smith knows that the next set of lights will likely be a triple red telling the train to stop. He was getting no answer and the train wasn't slowing down. An emergency brake cord was in easy reach, but Smith never pulled it. Jack, are you there? With Hudson mysteriously silent, Jack, Smith says he does nothing but continue to call the front end. Front end, Jack, come in. Why in the circumstances that you've described did you not pull the brake? Oh, I, I felt the engineer had the train under control. I felt he, in fact, was doing what was necessary to control the train at that point. I never felt at any point in time that I should pull the emergency brake. At that time, I didn't think that anything was wrong. That's the point I make, Mr. Smith, that when there's a problem with the radio, you've been trained over the years to observe the signals. And it, it would have been the last thing I would have done. He didn't pull the brake, he didn't pull the air, because he felt that it hadn't reached that point. Uh, basically, that was his evidence, and uh, I had a lot of difficulty with that because uh, if, if, it, uh, if that point hadn't been reached, when was it going to be reached, if ever? Smith's contradictory testimony is complete. Judge Foisy is now ready to close his case and lay the blame on those responsible for the disaster. The inquiry into one of the deadliest train crashes in Canada is complete. 23 people were killed when a freight train crashed head-on into a passenger train near Hinton, Alberta. Chief Investigator René Foisy has explored every angle, from technical malfunction to human error. He's now ready to deliver his report on what went wrong that day. In his 205-page report, Foisy parcels out the blame, naming all the key offenders. Foisy writes that the train's engineer, Jack Hudson, failed to observe and obey light signals, commanding him to stop his train before it entered the single track. If Hudson was unable to do his job, brakeman Mark Edwards failed to intervene. He also ignored the light signals and didn't brake the train before it entered the single track. Conductor Wayne Smith was guilty too, he had failed to follow operating rules and pull the emergency brake when he couldn't contact the two men at the front of the train. In a statement to police, he had even suggested that he thought they were sleeping. Said that my head end was asleep. 
Do you recall making that response, sir? Yes, I do. With so many contradictions in his testimony, Foisy rules that the conductor's evidence Uriel, is unreliable. I wasn't sure what, I, what, ha what had happened. And uh, I went to my back desk. I jumped on from the cupola and uh, ran for... It seemed like we were just keeping going. There was no immediate stopping. The caboose kept sliding. Instead, Foisy emphasizes that Smith, like Edwards and Hudson, was dangerously tired that morning. I just wanted to get home, actually, at the time. But the crew aren't the only ones Foisy blames for the accident. According to the Foisy report, Jack Hudson may well have had a stroke or heart attack before the collision. But CN management had known about Hudson's medical record for years. He managed to accumulate, uh, I think it was 40 or 50 demerits, and at 60, you're fired. But after he got to that level, uh, there were some other infractions which weren't recorded. Foisy also calls attention to the rules that were routinely ignored, such as rigging the dead man's pedal and taking the train on the fly. The conclusion we came to is that there was a, a lot to be desired on the part of CN. Um, and that, yes, there was certainly some laxness uh, and some complacency when it came to uh, these areas. Uh, I'll get a measure at Medicine Lodge here. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, that's, uh, you got pretty well all green cars, eh? Yeah, I think so. There is a lesson to be learned here. It's that when you have rules, you obey the rules, and you enforce the rules. Uh, if it becomes too much of a fraternity and of a buddy-buddy system, it gets lax, and problems occur, and this tragedy was one of them. Foisy demands that CN improve its safety equipment, recommending that all trains be equipped with reset safety control technology. These systems are much more complicated than a dead man's pedal. If constant attention is not paid to the train, alarms sound and the train eventually shuts down. It's equipment which has proved valuable several times since the disaster. There was a study done uh, with CN 10 years after this accident. They found something like 90% of the train engineers saying that they had been woken by the alerting device at least once. In response to Foisy's report, CN Rail creates one of the most sophisticated fatigue countermeasures programs in the world. Train men are no longer on call seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Napping is no longer frowned upon. Rest houses have been created and improved, and locomotive cabs made more comfortable. For the victims of the Hinton disaster of 1986, changes to Canadian railroading come too late. I still remember the people that were killed in the accident and good friends I had on the railroad. And that's really, it does bother me. It's now, it's uh, 20 years nearly. And I'm still going strong. Very lucky. I don't equate it to luck, no. No, that, too much of a tragedy to think about luck. It, too much, there's too much hurt that happened inside of me. It took me quite a while to rebuild my, my sanity again. I got over it fairly quickly and got on with their life. There may be lots of other people who weren't as lucky. You can be going along in life and then something can come along and just kind of destroy your very foundation or shatter your very foundation and through no fault of your own. But life has a habit of doing that. But the other thing I can share with them is that you can recover from it. There is a tomorrow.